in this tutorial, we are going to talk about the Josephson effect, a phenomenon that plays a major role in condensed matter physics and also in many implementations of quantum computing and quantum sensing. Without it, superconducting qubits, which are one of the most promising platforms for quantum computing, would not exist, nor could we read their state, since Josephson junctions allow the fabrication of the most sensitive quantum amplifiers that exist to date. Superconductivity is sometimes understood as the condensation of bosonic particles, called Cooper pairs. A Cooper pair is formed by two electrons, having opposite momentum and spin. This is, however, not completely accurate and can be misleading, because electrons cannot be coupled into localized pairs. The key elements are not pairs, but pairing. Cooper pairing takes place not between electrons, but between the states that electrons can occupy in k-momentum space close to the Fermi level. Indeed, only electrons close to the Fermi level can participate. Therefore, we cannot forget that they are Fermi particles. Quoting Bardeen, condensation comes from the exclusion principle itself. Pairing allows one to make best use of the available k-momentum space to form a coherent superconducting condensate. The transition to the superconducting state arises from a spontaneous breaking of the symmetry, characterized by a complex order parameter with non-zero expectation value in the order state. The order parameter has a well-defined but arbitrary phase, theta, that, as we will see later, is not gate invariant and cannot be measured directly. The modulus squared of the other parameter represents the density of Cooper pairs. The resulting condensate can be well described as a coherent state. The latter is a superposition of number states with indefinite number of particles. Indeed, the coherent state forms a Poisson distribution in the number state basis, although the mean number of particles can be fixed, defining the density of Cooper pairs. On the other hand, this state is characterized by a well-defined phase, theta, and is typically used to describe the radiation field of lasers. It is precisely phase coherence which allows lasers' waves to interfere with themselves. The superconducting condensate is also phase coherent and can also interfere with itself by virtue of the Josephson effect, as we will see later. Superconducting materials are well known for conducting electricity without losses. Although this property is remarkable, it is not the only peculiar characteristic of superconductors. Phase coherence imprint much more profound consequences that we will review in the next. 1. The meissner oxenfeld effect. This is maybe the uttermost macroscopic property of superconductors. When a superconducting material is cooled down below its critical temperature in presence of an external magnetic field, it will expel the field from its interior during transition. This is true except for a small material-dependent region called the London penetration depth, where shielding supercurrents are allowed to flow. This behavior cannot be simply explained by perfect conductivity. 2. Perfect conductivity. Resistivity in normal metals comes from the scattering of electrons with lattice vibrations that we call phonons. The total energy of the electron might not be conserved after each scattering event, so that, in the presence of an electric field, electronic current yields energy dissipation in the form of heat. If the electric field is switched to zero, the total current goes to zero as well. In superconductors, electrons also suffer from phonon scattering events that change their momentum. However, it is precisely these events that allow the electron to visit various k states and form a superposition of many different momentum states. In the absence of current, the total momentum remains zero since the phonon that is emitted by one electron is immediately absorbed by the other. When an electric current is applied, the wave function still retains its symmetry, but now the whole condensate moves with momentum capital K, with a common center of mass. Also here, the total momentum is conserved and there is no energy exchange. The condensate moves with no dissipation of energy. Zero resistivity in superconductors is the zeroest observable in physics. This has important practical consequences if you work with superconducting thin films, with thickness comparable to the London penetration depth. 
the fact that superelectrons are charge carriers with perfect mobility brings an important role to the concept of kinetic inductance, since it takes a finite time to accelerate particles with mass. The kinetic inductance is inversely proportional to the cross-section, therefore it is negligible in superconductors much thicker than the London penetration depth. However, it might become relevant in thin films. 3. The superconducting energy gap. The condensation into a coherent state allows decreasing the energy of superconducting material. Now, removing available empty K states close to the Fermi level is detrimental. Thus, it costs a finite amount of energy that the system has to pay. We call this process Cooper pair breaking, and it yields the production of two ampere electrons or quasiparticle excitations. Quasiparticles are always present in equilibrium at temperatures different from the absolute zero, and they exhibit a density of states characterized by a peculiar energy gap. 4. Macroscopic phase and flux quantization. For a moment, think of the Cooper pair as a quantum object with a total momentum k and mass. To M. According to De Broglie, such a quantum particle has as an associate wave, defined by a phase theta and a wavelength lambda. At rest, when k equals zero, the wavelength is infinite and the phase is constant along the condensate. However, when the particle moves, k becomes different from zero, and a finite wavelength causes phase gradients in the condensate, but keeping its long-range order character. The phase of the superconducting condensate is of enormous conceptual interest and is responsible of the phenomenon of flux, or more precisely, fluxoid quantization in superconducting loops. Flux quantization is very relevant for the development of quantum technologies, as much as the Josephson effect. Therefore, let's devote a few minutes to understand this concept. We have seen that supercurrents induce phase gradients in the superconducting condensate and phase gradients induce supercurrents. But currents in superconductors can also arise from a magnetic field. Indeed, in writing the Schrödinger equation of a charged particle in a magnetic field, we must take into account its kinetic momentum with contribution from the canonical momentum and the vector magnetical potential A. Both theta and A are quantities that have a physical meaning, but cannot be observed experimentally. On the other hand, electric currents and magnetic flux densities can be measured in the lab. A physically meaningful observable quantity must be gauge invariant due to the arbitrariness of the gauge parameter. This is to say, you can always find a scalar chi that add to theta and A in a precise way yield the same current and magnetic field. Now, it turns out that you can define a gauge invariant phase gradient between two points as the phase gradient of the macroscopic wave function plus an additional term taking into account the vector potential A. On this way, the supercurrent density is simply proportional to the gradient of the gauge invariant phase phi. That is a measurable observable. Imagine now a superconducting loop placed in a magnetic field. The latter will obviously induce a flux that corresponds to the closed integral of the vector magnetic potential around the loop. On the other hand, due to the Meissner effect, no supercurrent will flow deep inside the material. With no current, we have that the gauge invariant phase must be constant in space. The magnetic flux is therefore directly related to the phase accumulated around the loop, that is gauge invariant. Since the wave function must be single valued, any variation of the phase must equal an integral multiple of 2 pi. The latter can only be satisfied if the flux is quantized in unit of the flux quantum, which is a tiny quantity, defined from fundamental constants. Notice that it contains twice the elementary charge of the electron. Indeed, the demonstration of the flux quantization in units of two times the electron charge was a notable experimental proof of electron pairing. We have finally arrived to the topic of this tutorial, the Josephson effect. Brian Josephson was a theoretical physicist fascinated by the idea of broken symmetry in superconductors, searching for an experimental proof of macroscopic phase coherence. Phase alone is not measurable, so Josephson focused on the phase difference among two condensates. 
These superconductors, however, could not be isolated from each other, but able of exchanging particles among them. In this way, thought Josephson, the largest uncertainty would affect the particle number and the phase would remain well defined. That is how Josephson arrived to the tunnel junction, a thin insulating layer connecting two bulky superconducting electrodes. It turns out that two years before that, Ivar Javert was able of demonstrating the existence of the superconducting energy gap using similar kind of junctions, although with a big difference. Javert showed that a voltage bias tunnel junction between a normal and a superconducting metal allows to perform energy spectroscopy of the density of states. At zero voltage, no normal electrons are allowed to tunnel, since there are no allowed states in the gapped superconductor. But as the voltage is increased up to, a precise, up to precisely the value of the gap, normal electrons are allowed to tunnel. Differentiating the experimental current with respect to the applied voltage, you will indeed obtain a quite precise description of the density of states of quasi-particles in your superconductor and the corresponding energy gap. In view of that, you might expect that putting together two superconducting electrodes would simply yield a similar behavior, with the only difference of observing two times the energy gap. This was indeed what Joseph so expected, since at that time he thought that the probability of Cooper pair tunneling was negligible. He had, however, the hope to observe some reminiscence of the phase difference in the tunneling of normal electrons. His argument was simple. Matrix elements in superconductors are different from those in a normal metal, due to coherence terms. After all, normal electrons arise from the breaking of phase coherence Cooper pairs. Therefore, a phase-dependent term could arise in the tunneling of quasi-particles. With this hope, Josephson calculated the tunneling current across a superconducting tunnel junction and found out that he was right. Such term indeed exists and relates a normal current that dissipates heat with the phase difference across the junction. The existence of a similar term in heat transport has been actually demonstrated experimentally, proving that the intuition of Josephson was right. However, such term is nowadays forgotten by many physicists that they don't even know that it, it exists. There is a reason for that. Josephson found an unexpected term that has attracted the attention of many researchers since then. According to the first Josephson equation, a non-dissipative supercurrent can also flow through the weak link, even in the absence of a biased voltage, as long as there is a phase difference between the electrodes. This current is a periodic function of the gauge invariant phase difference across the junction, with maximum value given by the maximum critical current, I sub zero. In an ideal Josephson junction, the dependence is sinusoidal, but more complex periodic functions can also be found. I sub zero is the maximum supercurrent that a junction can withstand since larger currents yield Cooper pair breaking. The critical current can be estimated from the normal state resistance of the junction and the temperature-dependent superconducting energy gap, thanks to the ambegaokar baratov equation. Now, it turns out that applying a voltage difference between both macroscopic condensates has very relevant consequences, as it makes the gauge invariant phase vary over time. This is the second Josephson equation, or AC Josephson effect that reflects a temporal interference of the phase. This means that, under the action of a biased voltage, supercurrents will oscillate back and forth at enormously large frequencies, close to 500 GHz per millivolt. This reminds to the behavior of an inductor, but a classical inductor develops a linearly increasing current when a voltage difference is applied. The Josephson junction instead is a highly nonlinear inductor, and it is precisely this property what makes Josephson junctions a precious object to build quantum circuits. The inductance of the single Josephson junction is periodic in the phase and symmetric with respect to the bias current. When the bias is much smaller than I sub zero, it is a good approximation to consider the inductance as a linear function of the bias current squared. But the current and the inductance are not the only periodic characteristics of Josephson junctions. Also, the energy will depend periodically on the gauge invariant phase difference, with a maximum value given by the Josephson energy. 
Typically, energy is minimized when the phase equals zero or multiples of 2 pi. But under special conditions, it is possible to create junctions stabilized for arbitrary values of the phase. These junctions are usually referred to as phi junctions.